What's up guys? Uh, as you can tell by the title of this video, my goal is to make a case for clean meat and to explain why I, as an ethical vegan, support this technology. Now, before I delve too deeply into this video, I should probably make a clarification about clean meat's target market, which is not vegetarians, it's not vegans, it's not people who are already looking for ethical, healthy alternatives to meat. Clean meat's uh, target market, rather clean meat startups like Mosa Meats and Modern Meadows, their target market is meat lovers. So people who love meat uh, staunchly uh, and are not interested in giving substituting meat with uh, a plant-based alternative, these are people who may have diseases which make it difficult to become a vegan, or even owners of obligate carnivores like pet like cats. So pet owners who own cats may also find clean meat technology useful. I'm making this clarification because my goal is not to convince vegans watching this video to eat clean meat. My goal is to get vegans to support this technology as a viable alternative for people who love to eat meat, so for carnists, not for vegans. Now, what exactly is clean meat? So clean meat, aka lab-grown meat, or more formally referred to as in vitro meat, is meat that is grown and cultured inside of a laboratory rather than in an animal. For something that seems to be so easy to describe, swaying public opinion about clean meat and other in vitro technology can be quite complicated. The first and most fundamental thing to understand about clean meat is that it is a solution. It's a solution to a wide range of systematic problems that likely will not go away otherwise, at least not for quite some time. But what exactly is the problem, or wide range of problems, that clean meat is supposed to solve? The environmental degradation, scarcity of resources, animal suffering, and bacterial resistance to antibiotic usage are all various challenges presented when eating meat. For example, a pig must eat 5 to 9 pounds of grain to gain 1 pound of weight, and a cow must eat 6 to 27 pounds of grain to gain 1 pound of weight. Once you take into account that not even all parts of the animal is eaten, like the brain, the blood, the bones, and the tendons, then you realize that cycling crops through animals, then eating the animals is inefficient, and is a net loss of both calories and nutrition. It's also less energy efficient, thanks to thermodynamics. In general, only about 10% of the energy consumed by one trophic level is available in the next. For example, if hares consumed 1,000 calories of plant energy, they might only be able to form 100 calories of new hair tissue. The higher up through the trophic levels that energy is transferred, from the producer to the herbivore to the omnivore to the carnivore, the greater level of energy lost. Pigs, cows, and other farm animals also belch and fart millions of tons of methane and carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Methane is 30 times more potent than carbon dioxide. These greenhouse gases are released into the atmosphere, they trap infrared radiation, and raise the Earth's climate. Globally, animal agriculture accounts for about 24% of greenhouse gas emissions, which is comparable to the entire transportation industry. Disease and antibiotic resistance are another issue. Factory farmers feed their animals antibiotics for the treatment, control, and prevention of disease. However, the overuse of antibiotics helps to establish resistant strains of bacteria, and food animals harbor millions of bacteria in their intestines. When slaughtered and processed, the resistant strains can contaminate the meat and other animal products, and lead to human infection. Now, would demanding that the world go vegan, or liberate animals from their subjugation, would this be a viable solution to the problem? Perhaps, but perhaps not. History shows us that animal welfare sentiment alone rarely serves uh, as a catalyst, a strong enough catalyst, to change how we treat them. In his book Clean Meat, Paul Shapiro speaks about New York's horse manure crisis of 1894. He also spoke about how humans almost overhunted blue whales to extinction in the 19th and early 20th century. Obviously, in one scenario, horses were, they were subjugated, they were treated terribly, and they produced a lot of manure which also harmed humans, and in the other scenario, the whales were almost completely eradicated. But did animal sentiment, animal welfare sentiment, alleviate either of these issues. In the end, what freed horses from labor in our streets and what saved New York City from literally drowning in horse poop wasn't humane sentiment nor environmental concern. Just as kerosene helped save the whales, internal combustion engines helped replace horses as our primary means of transport. It was an inventor's imagination, not a social movement's moral judgment, which rescued the horses. As Paul Shapiro alluded to, it was the discovery of kerosene that saved the whales from extinction, Similarly, it was the invention of the car that freed horses from human subjugation, 
And similarly, uh, clean meat can help to free the factory farmed animals of today from subjugation, as producing this meat does not require an animal. This study, posted in the Journal of Environmental Science and Technology, found that cultured meat, if made commercially viable, would be far more resource efficient, requiring between 7 and 45 percent less energy, 96 percent less water, and 99 percent less land than conventional beef. Such a product could not perspire or have flatulence, and would greatly reduce greenhouse gas emissions when compared to conventional meat, which is grown on a breathing, farting animal. Animal suffering would also be greatly reduced. Animal slaughter would be rendered moot, since we wouldn't have to slaughter the animal for its meat. And even if the scientists cannot establish immortal cell lines, uh, the animals could just be anesthetized while the, the researchers collect the cells from them. And clean meat would literally be cleaner, void of the intestinal pathogens that riddle the bodies of slaughtered animal corpses. This would also eliminate the need for antibiotics for said product. So far, we see that clean meat has the potential to improve health, uh, reduce environmental cost, and protect the welfare of animals. So why don't more vegans seem to support this technology? Well, there are a few criticisms, and I will briefly discuss five of them. So right away, there appears to be some deontological opposition to clean meat. Uh, the two most common arguments I hear from the deontological vegans are, one, it's meat. So it cannot fall under any, uh, the, the most commonly accepted definition of vegan, which is someone who does not eat animal products. A second deontological argument against clean meat is that by eating clean meat, we are exploiting the animal's DNA and stealing their cells without their consent. First, veganism is a living, nuanced ideology, so it can be generally difficult getting a large group of people to concede to one very specific definition of vegan. One thing that can be said to be true for many vegans is that veganism is a convenient way to significantly reduce animal harm, and meat, clean meat, has the potential to vastly reduce or even eliminate animal harm. And the deontological argument about the exploitation of their genes is pure nonsense. Animals cannot give consent to researchers to have their cells collected and harvested. They don't understand consent. They are not capable of giving consent. They don't have a concept of consent. Nor do they have a concept of exploitation. But animals do understand harm. They understand suffering. They understand pain. And they go to great lengths to avoid pain. And clean meat can reduce pain and suffering to animals. The argument that by eating clean meat you are normalizing the consumption of animal products that's also complete nonsense, considering that most Americans have an aversion to science and have an ick factor when it comes to lab-grown products. By eating clean meat, you are normalizing the spread of a product that could potentially save millions of lives. Overall, I don't find any of the deontological opposition to clean meats compelling. Fetal bovine serum is exactly what it sounds like. It's a blood-based fetal serum extracted from the recently slaughtered corpse of a cow. Now, FBS is a commonly used serum supplement and in vitro culture because of the high level of growth factors uh, that stimulate stem cells. This obviously has some ethical implications because of the potential to cause harm to the fetus. I do agree that Clean meat that is used with fetal bovine serum uh, should not be considered vegan, and it probably would not be more ethical than regularly conventionally produced meat. Fortunately, commercially available serum-free alternatives are viable options for culturing animal cells, and researchers have been able to effectively culture animal cells with a serum-free medium extracted from maitake mushrooms. Some cells show an even higher rate of growth with maitake mushroom extract than with fetal bovine serum. This could serve as a more ethical and feasible alternative to fetal bovine serum for culturing animal cells. Immortal cell lines are is something that most clean meat startups are trying to establish so that they don't have to continuously do biopsies on live animals. Mosa Meats claims they still need donor animals, with just one sample of a cow being able to make 20,000 tons of beef. This is causing much less harm than completely slaughtering the animal for its meat, uh, but uh, it is not necessarily the outcome that most vegans would feel comfortable with if they are going to support this technology. One solution is to establish immortal cell lines that can be shared between clean meat producers and used as a consistent, indefinitely reproducing source of meat. While even differentiated cell lines can be immortalized through genetic tricks, 
pluripotent and multipotent stem cells, which can differentiate into all of the necessary cell types within the final product, are often naturally immortal, making these especially appealing for clean meat applications. Researchers are working hard to establish immortal cell lines that can be shared between companies and used as a continuous source for clean meat. So this would uh, render the collection of live cells from animals moot. There were also valid concerns about the maturity of this technology and the feasibility of this concept. Some vegans even claim that supporting clean meat is like putting blind faith in some technology. I still think this is pretty silly considering that clean meat is not something like science fiction. Uh, it is science, right? It's real. And Dr. Mark Post, PhD of pulmonary pharmacology, unveiled the world's first lab-grown hamburger in 2013. And speaking on the feasibility of this technology, uh, Paul Shapiro did mention in his book that the sequencing of the human genome, the process initially took years and took billions of dollars of investment. And today, in 2018, the sequencing of the human genome can be done for under $1,000 for a couple days. Now, at the time that Mark Post unveiled the world's first cultured hamburger, it costed over $300,000 just for that one tiny burger. Now, today, fortunately, the price has dropped exponentially to just $11.36 per patty. Hopefully, by the time that clean meat becomes commercially available, it will compete with conventional meat. Clean meat pioneers have proposed several options for the large-scale production of clean meat, including stirred tank reactors, perfusion reactors, and packed bed reactors. Developing and testing this equipment simply requires, you guessed it, additional funding and a coordinated engineering effort. To render this product feasible, we would need far less expensive growth factors. We'd also need to increase the size and efficiency of bio reactors and ditch the blood-based serums. By far the biggest opposition that I have received uh, in regard to supporting clean meat is that the public will not come to see clean meat as meat. I can sort of see the, the argument that the public will probably have this ick factor regarding lab-produced meat. And I find it very interesting and quite ironic considering that conventional meat, uh, with the conventional meat process, animals are injected with hormones and with antibiotics and their corpses are often riddled with feces and intestinal pathogens like salmonella and E. coli. Uh, I find this ironic considering that conventional meat is, is far filthier and worse for our health than with clean meat. Clean meat would be clean. It would be free, rid of these pathogens and of feces and of hormones. So I find this odd, but uh, in terms of warming consumers up to clean meat, what we could do is support first other in vitro and other clean uh, technology. Currently, Modern Meadows, one of these lab-grown startups, is more dedicated to producing lab-grown leather than it is producing lab-grown meat. Bioengineers over at Perfect Day are producing cow's milk with genetically engineered yeast cells. Once consumers have been introduced to the idea of other lab-grown products like lab-grown leather and even lab-grown spider silk, uh, and lab-grown dairy milk, then this might warm them up to the idea of lab-grown meat. Then, after the stigmas have been sort of washed away, then we can inform them about the safety and the, uh, the benefits of clean meat uh, when compared to conventional meat. So this could be another effective way to help get rid of or lessen that ick factor that the, major that the public has about science and also lab-grown products. Unfortunately, if we want clean meat to succeed, we may want other lab-grown products to succeed first. Alrighty guys, well that's it. That's all that I wanted to talk about today. Uh, and this is a really complicated, a really, really large topic. And as an, I'm a lay person, I am not a scientist, I don't know a lot about this. And so if you want to get a lot more information about this, be sure to check out the uh, the links in the description below and also be sure to check out Dr. Mark Post. Uh, so he is PhD of pulmonary pharmacology. He is an expert and he does do research on cultured meat. So be sure to check out his work uh, and I will link to him as well. I am open to criticism and uh, what have you in the comments down below. Just a disclaimer, I do not respond to walls of text. So do not send, do not post five or six paragraphs in the comment section and think that I will respond. I won't respond to it. So if you want a longer style debate with me, then you should join the Philosophical Vegan Forum. I'm really active there, and that's that's more appropriate for, for long comments. I'm not going to be on YouTube commenting like that. So yes, that's all.
Thank you so much, guys, for watching, and peace.